So I've talked a lot on my channel about how continental weathering, weathering of rocks, and transport of that material to oceans can induce carbon burial and carbon sequestration. In other words, the storage of carbon in rocks that form at the ocean floor, decreasing atmospheric carbon levels, potentially combating climate change. And because of the potential for carbon sequestration within marine sediments, this idea called ocean fertilization came about. So in this video, I'm gonna be talking about this idea of ocean fertilization, what it is, and whether it will help reverse climate change or, you know, not. And what other potential consequences it might have. So before we talk about ocean fertilization, I have to introduce this term called primary productivity, which don't click off the video. It's going to be relatively basic. I'm not going to go deeply into biological processes in the ocean or all of that. But the process of primary productivity is central to ocean fertilization. So what is primary productivity? Well, we all know the food chain, right? Larger marine life eats smaller marine life and so on. But what does the smallest marine organism eat? Well, actually, these smallest kind of bottom of the food chain organisms in the ocean are called phytoplankton, and they include bacteria and algae at the ocean surface. Because these organisms photosynthesize and get their carbon from inorganic carbon dioxide rather than organic sources, they are what are called autotrophs. They produce their own food. All other animal life and other bacteria that have to eat bacteria or other organic matter to get their carbon to build their bodies with, like ourselves, we are called heterotrophs. But these autotrophs are primary producers because they're the first line in the production of food that goes up the food chain. Plants are an example of terrestrial primary producers because they make food the same way. They photosynthesize and get their carbon from inorganic sources. Then things like us and other animals eat them or eat the animals that eat them to get our carbon. But like all life, these primary producers or these phytoplankton, these bacteria, these algae at the ocean surface need a little bit more than just light and carbon dioxide. They need other nutrients like nitrogen, phosphorus, and iron. Because these nutrients help them to grow, reproduce, and subsequently feed the rest of life in the food chain, we can actually fertilize this process. In other words, we can actively input more nutrients like iron, phosphorus, and nitrogen to the ocean in order to induce more growth of these primary producers of these bacteria and algae at the ocean surface which in turn will increase carbon burial rates because an increase in the rate of production of organic carbon by these organisms, in other words, an increase of their uptake of carbon dioxide and conversion of that carbon dioxide to organic carbon, in other words, their biomass, their bodies, leads to an increase in carbon burial rates because eventually those dead bodies rain down to the sea floor as what is called marine snow. And if they don't get decomposed by other organisms, that snow of dead bodies will form sediment, ocean sediment, organic matter rich sediment, which then can become buried and stored long term, which can lead to a decrease in atmospheric carbon over geologic timescales. This process, because of the sequestration and long-term storage of carbon in sediments, could balance out our release of carbon from the rock record by oxidizing organic carbon to CO2 and releasing it to the atmosphere. Essentially, burning fossil fuels is the opposite process to photosynthesis. So if we increase the amount of photosynthesis and thus subsequent carbon burial, we could help to balance out our impact on the carbon cycle. In a way, we don't even need to go intentionally fertilize the ocean to do this because we kind of already are unintentionally fertilizing the ocean. One way we're doing this is by the overuse of fertilizers on land, which then, you know, that fertilizer enters runoff streams, which enter major river systems, which eventually run off into the ocean. Another way we're doing this is by overtilling soils. I talk about overtilling soils in my carbon sequestration video, which I'll link up to the top right if you want to check it out. But the gist is that overtilling soils leads to more rapid what's called desertification of 
that soil. In other words, it loses its organic matter rich humus layer or topsoil, and this loss of the humus layer leads to a more rapid conversion of that soil into essentially just dirt that isn't fertile at all. And this dirt, because it's not compacted together with that really organic matter rich layer, it's just loose. And this really loose dirt leads to dust because wind can just blow across it and carry it through the atmosphere. And when we have an increase in dust, we get an increase of dust transport to oceans. And if you've seen my recent video about how the Amazon rainforest is fertilized by Saharan dust, you know that dust transport can fertilize things. The reason is because dust contains nutrients like phosphorus, nitrogen, and iron that we talked about earlier, which is essential for primary producers, like on land, plants, and other photosynthesizing organisms, and in the ocean, bacteria and algae at the ocean surface. A third way we're doing this is by increasing continental weathering. So there are projects currently going on to increase continental weathering rates on purpose in order to increase carbon burial rates, like I talked about at the beginning of the video, but we are also unintentionally increasing continental weathering rates because our release of carbon to the atmosphere and the subsequent increase in rates of warming of Earth lead to increases in evaporation rates and thus rain. You know, climate change has an overall large effect on rain patterns as well. In some areas become drier and some wetter, but overall rain is increased during warm periods in Earth's history. And the warmer it gets, the more evaporation and the more overall rain that will occur. And when this rain falls over continents, it leads to more rapid continental weathering. In other words, the weathering of those rocks and the transport of those nutrients that the rocks contain to the ocean, further exacerbating the unintentional ocean fertilization of ocean margins that we're already seeing. So initially, your reaction to this information might be that, okay, the effects of global warming will actually reverse the global warming itself naturally, because global warming, any time in Earth's history, not just human-caused global warming, but any time global warming has occurred in Earth's history, there has been a subsequent increase in continental weathering rates, and thus eventually an increase in carbon burial rates and carbon storage, which leads to a period of cooling after that global warming period. So the short answer is yes, the effects of global warming will eventually cause it to reverse naturally, but natural carbon sequestration caused by increased weathering, desertification, and fertilization occurs at a much slower rate than our direct and immediate release of carbon to the atmosphere upon burning fossil fuels. So the rates don't match up in order for these processes that are burying carbon to match the rate of our human release of carbon. So we would have to stop releasing any carbon and then wait, you know, potentially millions of years for those other processes to reverse the trend of the warming, because it's going to take millions of years for those natural processes to sequester and store the carbon. And during those millions of years, the carbon that we've already released to the atmosphere will continue to warm Earth. So it's, it's not going to balance things out especially not at a rate that is human timescales, you know. Yes, there are ways that we can intentionally increase these rates, and there are projects going on to study that, hence the idea of ocean fertilization and projects that aim to increase continental weathering rates. However, a very rapid increase in primary productivity that would be caused by such efforts may have extinction-level consequences. So let me step back a second, because you might be wondering, how do we know the effects of ocean fertilization if we haven't fully carried it out yet? Well, we can see in the rock record many times in Earth's history that increases in nutrient fluxes or nutrient transport to the ocean have led to increases in primary productivity and subsequent increases in carbon burial and storage. And we do see that during these times, or immediately following these times, a cooling trend will occur. That is because the overall increase in carbon burial and decrease in atmospheric carbon leads to cooling, which is why the initial idea of ocean fertilization came up. The cooling would balance our current warming trend. However, cooling isn't the only effect that we see 
from these periods in Earth's history where increases in primary productivity have occurred. The major effect that is just a really bad, bad thing that we don't want to happen is called ocean anoxia. I've talked about this a lot on my channel because this is kind of the area that I specialize in, but basically ocean anoxia refers to the lack of oxygen in the ocean. Yes, dissolved oxygen, molecular O2 oxygen, is present in the ocean and is required for animal life. So fish, corals, sponges, sea urchins, sand dollars, clams, nautiluses, squids, octopuses, all of these animals in the ocean breathe oxygen that's in the water. So when the ocean becomes anoxic, these organisms will die, at least if they're in the region of the water column that became anoxic. Because of our already occurring unintentional ocean fertilization processes, we already are seeing increases in ocean hypoxia and anoxia. Hypoxia is like anoxia, but instead of the total lack of oxygen, it's just a great depletion in oxygen concentration. So very low oxygen concentrations, which hypoxia alone can cause major ecosystem disasters among animal ecosystems in the ocean. Obviously, as I mentioned in past videos, not all life in the ocean requires oxygen. Much of the microbial life in the ocean, in fact, hates oxygen. These are called anaerobic microbes, and these microbes might spread during times of anoxia. And in fact, in the rock record, we've seen times when anoxia has spread in the ocean. These are called ocean anoxic events. And during these times, often, these microbes called sulfate-reducing bacteria, which I, in fact, work with in the lab, spread because they don't like oxygen. So during times when there's less oxygen around, they're like, yay, let's go spread to all these new environments that we have available to us. But the problem with this is their metabolic byproduct is hydrogen sulfide, which is a toxic substance if high enough in concentration to animal life. So during ocean anoxic events in Earth's history, the ocean became not only anoxic, lacking oxygen, but also really sulfitic, which hindered animal life even more. So this is one of the major consequences of ocean fertilization if we decided to carry this out. But you might be wondering, how does ocean fertilization cause anoxia? Well, the reason that carbon burial rates increase when there's increases in primary productivity is because organisms below that algal bloom that decompose or try to decompose all that organic carbon can't keep up with the amount of organic carbon being produced. So ultimately more organic carbon, relatively more organic carbon during these times of increased primary productivity gets past the zone of other organisms trying to break it down and makes its way to the sediment where it then can become buried and stored long-term. However, because there's so much organic carbon being produced and thus so many organisms trying to break it down, all of those organisms below the bloom trying to break that down use up all the oxygen to do so. The decomposition of organic matter occurs first and foremost in the water column by aerobic respiration, that is, by using oxygen to oxidize the organic carbon and release it back to the water column and then atmosphere as carbon dioxide. Eventually, that organic carbon could make its way deep enough in the water column or sediment to reach anaerobic microbes that anaerobically break it down, but the first line of decomposers in the water column below that algal bloom includes aerobic respiring organisms that use oxygen. So they use up all the oxygen in the water column, depleting the oxygen levels beneath the blooms, which often outpaces the replacement of oxygen in these regions, and the water column becomes anoxic. This process is called eutrophication, over neutrifying of typically environments like coastal or estuary marine systems become too enriched with nutrients, and that increases phytoplankton growth and causes oxygen depletion, which destroys the ecosystems in those regions by killing or driving off all the animals. So consequences of ocean fertilization include ocean anoxia, which, if it becomes widespread enough, could cause the extinction of many species that are key to marine ecosystems, which subsequently can lead to the extinction of species that rely on such ecosystems, 
which then causes a mass extinction event. We've seen this time and time again with warming events and subsequent ocean anoxic events that cause mass extinctions in Earth's history. Now, this is not to say that it's not effective at reversing global warming. It is, based on past events, because as we see here in this demonstration, anytime there's an increase in primary productivity that causes oxygen depletion in the deep water column next to the sediment water interface, that causes an increase in organic carbon burial because the decomposers can't decompose all the organic carbon, it becomes buried, and it is this organic carbon burial and lack of replenishment by decomposers or oxygen respiring organisms to replenish the carbon dioxide pool that primary producers use that eventually terminates the ocean anoxic event and brings it back to a normal relatively stable balance of photosynthesis respiration cycle that it was in the first place. Anything can tip this cycle out of balance and cause another ocean anoxic event. However, it tends to balance itself back out because the lack of oxygen and the lack of decomposers leads to a lack of replenishment of that carbon dioxide pool, eventually limiting primary production and bringing things back around to normal. Because that whole anoxic period buried so much carbon in the sediment, which is going to be stored long term in the rocks, that leads to a cooling event that typically follows warming events if they're associated with ocean anoxia. So yeah, they cause cooling. They reverse warming, typically. But they simultaneously cause mass extinctions. In fact, ocean anoxia is one of the top mass extinction causes based on the typical things in Earth's past that have caused mass extinctions, which I talk about in my top three mass extinction causes video, which I'll link to the top right if you want to check it out. So overall, ocean fertilization could effectively reverse global warming, yes, but it would simultaneously likely cause a mass extinction, which kind of defeats the purpose if you ask me. But with that said, there may be a way to avoid ocean anoxia in our attempt to fertilize the oceans. How? Well, careful selection of nutrients, dosage, and timing, careful monitoring of the region and running models of potential outcomes before fertilization, artificial upwelling and downwelling in that region to prevent stratification, in other words, mixing the ocean up so that the oxygen doesn't become too depleted in the bottom waters and the top water gets recycled down to the bottom and vice versa to keep everything well oxygenated. And lastly, and potentially most importantly, careful location selection, specifically open ocean fertilization. We've so far only run ocean fertilization experiments, at least to my knowledge, in open ocean systems rather than coastal systems because the open ocean has much lower levels of primary productivity as it is than coastal regions due to the lower nutrient input from terrestrial ecosystems. But another reason that I love the idea of open ocean fertilization for is because it's less restricted physically than ocean margins or coastal regions. What does this mean? Well, it means that it's less prone to oxygen depletion and anoxia because it undergoes more mixing of the water column from large scale ocean circulation. The thing with some coastal regions is they, because they're right up against the land and sometimes there's topography in the ocean that can cause relatively restricted basins within the ocean, these restricted regions can be much more prone to oxygen depletion and anoxia because they get kind of blocked off from large scale circulation. And this leads to a more rapid stratification of the water column, which just means a layering of the water column that is really productive upper ocean water column and really oxygen depleted bottom water column. And this stratification can just exacerbate ocean anoxia. Whereas if we have, you know, large scale circulation still operating in the region, then it shouldn't stratify as easily. It shouldn't become as anoxic, especially if we're careful about the dosage, the timing and the nutrient selection. But ocean anoxia, like I mentioned earlier, isn't the only problem with this ocean fertilization fix for climate change. Because even if we could avoid 
causing things to become anoxic, it'll likely take thousands of years, even with our input, our human intervention, to fertilize enough of the ocean in an effective and anoxic avoidant way to start seeing these effects of carbon burial and storage, and thus to start balancing out our release of carbon. Rocks just can't form as fast as we break them down. Another problem worth mentioning is it would take so much carbon production to even see a tiny bit become buried. This is because overall, less than 1% of the organic carbon produced by primary productivity gets buried and ultimately preserved in the rock record. I talk about this in my carbon burial and diagenesis video, but just to break it down briefly for a second, the total organic carbon is produced by phytoplankton, primary productivity blooms. And about 55% of this is released as dissolved in organic or organic carbon that gets kind of recycled back into this use by primary productivity and decomposition by the organisms below them. Whereas 45% is converted to biomass by decomposers. So the organisms below them use that organic carbon or eat up that organic carbon to build their biomass, their bodies. Then as their dead organic carbon bodies fall through the water column, most of this organic carbon is used by other microbes and again converted back into dissolved inorganic and organic carbon that gets reused in this cycle. Whereas a small percentage becomes buried in the sediments. So. There we go, a small percentage, right? That's good, that's better than less than 1%, right? Well, when it's in the sediments, it's not necessarily out of the woods because there are microbes still in the sediments. Of this tiny fraction that gets buried in the sediment, much of that still becomes recycled and only the most resistant organic materials, less than 1%, become preserved in the rocks for long geologic timescales, millions of years. So ultimately, the rate is a problem. The rate at which rocks can form just doesn't compare to the rate at which we break them down. And the percentage of carbon that actually becomes buried and preserved long term from this process is very small. So could ocean fertilization be effective at combating climate change and the current rise in carbon in the atmosphere? Sure. We'd have to go about it in a way that would make sure we avoid ocean anoxia, which I think is possible if we use more open ocean, careful monitoring, modeling techniques like I talked about, but it's definitely not the cure-all. We're not going to just do that and things will be okay. We're going to need to find other, especially more rapid ways that we can decrease carbon levels in the atmosphere. If you want to know more about carbon sequestration, I recommend you check out my carbon sequestration video where I talk all about it, as well as other ways that we can increase carbon sequestration, um, which is really exciting. I'm not going to spoil it, but spoiler alert, it has to do with the amazing abilities of soil, which can sequester so much carbon, you guys, and store it, which is really important. So I talk about that in that video. You can check that out if you want to. And with that, guys, thank you so much for watching. My references, as always, are linked in my description box below, and I can't wait to see you guys next time. Bye.